Grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The lesson for our meditation this morning is the gospel lesson read a moment ago from Luke chapter 7. And our sermon theme today is entitled, Beyond All Doubt, Dear Friends and Beloved Brothers and Sisters in Christ Jesus. So, one Christian says to another Christian, You ever have any doubts about God? In one sense, doubting God is wrong. So it's something that most of us would have a hard time admitting that we do. And God is your only source of strength and peace, so if you doubt Him, you've got nothing to lean on. That can rob you of your peace, make you an emotional, maybe physical wreck, can cause us to make bad, ungodly decisions in life, and will ultimately cause you heartache. The truth is that all of us by nature are sinful, and as sinners, all of us do at times, in fact, doubt God. And doubting God is definitely hard on the Christian's mind and heart. Well, it might be helpful for you to know that there's no shortage of biblical characters who can relate to this. Many of God's greatest servants doubted on occasion. In our text today from Luke chapter 7, we are reconnected to a great prophet of God named John the Baptist. John the Baptist was really the last of the Old Testament prophets. Yeah, he is in the New Testament, but he was the last one in the line of prophets who would point to Jesus before Jesus actually appeared. And John the Baptist was a very faithful prophet. You could make the argument that John the Baptist was, in fact, the greatest prophet of them all. Even Jesus himself spoke pretty highly of John the Baptist in our text today. But as we heard, even a great prophet like John the Baptist will have doubts. Those who have struggled with doubts about God would very well benefit from reading about John the Baptist and the doubts that he experienced and most importantly, how Jesus responded to his doubts. Yeah, it turns out John the Baptist is a whole lot like us. He knew what he thought he knew about Jesus and about his own calling. John had been quite sure about Jesus. John had known that his job was going to be to prepare the way for the coming Christ. And his job description was made crystal clear because the Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah, had so clearly talked about what John would do when his time would come. And John had done his job very, very well. John's preaching showed clearly that he was not in the business of saying what was going to be popular. He wasn't concerned with making friends. He didn't care what people thought. He only cared about what God thought. John was only concerned with proclaiming God's truth, both his law and his gospel. He was only concerned with being faithful to his calling, and he was very faithful to that calling. Heck, John the Baptist was even given the unspeakable privilege of baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River. There wasn't any room for doubt in John's ministry, and he was very sure of his calling in Christ. And then things changed. As John was going on about his business, all of a sudden he finds himself in jail. And for what, you may ask? Well, King Herod at the time had taken his own sister-in-law to be his wife in an act of defiant, unrepentant adultery. <clears throat> so, 
John did what he was called to do. He called the king to repentance. But instead of repenting, the king had John arrested. So for all of his faithfulness, John was sitting in jail, a very scared man. He knew there was quite a possibility that Herod would have him put to death. So John's future is bleak, and he knows it. So John the Baptist had done everything right, and look how it turns out. And just like it is with our sinful nature, this is the point in time where John the Baptist starts to doubt. He begins second-guessing everything. Did he do the right thing? Was he really called to be the forerunner to Jesus? Is Jesus really the Christ after all? John had expected the Messiah to come and bring judgment and wipe out evil and sin everywhere, but instead, Jesus had only done works of compassion and mercy. Given John's circumstances, what Jesus was doing didn't make a whole lot of sense to him. Why doesn't Jesus just overthrow King Herod with a mighty show of force? Why are all of the good things that John did simply being ignored by God? Why? Well, John's faulty expectations of who he thought Jesus ought to be had led him to the confusion and the doubt that he's experienced. Is Jesus really the one to come, or should we look for another? Maybe he'd been wrong the whole time. As if John isn't in agony enough, now he is doubting his only source of peace and strength during a real spiritual crisis, and that's making the situation much worse. Now, at this point, we would do well to answer the following question. What faulty expectations of Jesus do we have? Often, we're tempted to believe that because our trust is in Jesus, then nothing bad or difficult or hurtful is going to happen to us. Sometimes we might buy into that belief that if we're a really good, faithful Christian, then we won't ever suffer any serious illnesses. We won't ever lose our jobs. We won't ever have financial problems. We won't ever have any worries about our loved ones. And they won't have any problems in their lives either. Many are being led to question or doubt God because of the horrifying events that have unfolded in our world over the last two years or so. But do we as Christians expect Jesus to shield us from everything hurtful or fearful or stressful? And are we really surprised when we have to experience that? The problem with these misunderstandings about Jesus is that sometimes they can throw us into doubt when the suffering actually does come. We never thought that it would happen to me. It's not supposed to happen to us. It only happens to them, but not us Christians. And then the natural next step is to start asking questions about God. Why would he let this happen? Does he even care anymore? Maybe he's not trustworthy after all. Maybe we should reevaluate our entire way of thinking about God. Maybe he's really not the one. Just like John the Baptist experienced doubt in the face of trials and pain, the same thing can and does happen to us. But notice how the text turned out. What did John the Baptist do? He took his doubts to the right place. He took his doubts straight to Jesus. 
he sent his disciples to ask Jesus about him to calm his doubts. And when John came to Jesus with doubts, how did Jesus react? Did Jesus turn his back on John in disgust? No. Did Jesus chastise John for his weak faith? No. Did Jesus respond to John's doubt with love and mercy? Yes. Jesus addressed John's doubt. And to calm those doubts, Jesus pointed to all the things he has done. Jesus said his actions speak for themselves. Blind people can now see. Crippled people can now walk. Lepers are cleansed of their disease. Deaf people now can hear. Dead people are being raised back to life. The life-giving gospel of forgiveness is being preached to everyone. And after seeing Jesus do all of that, is there really any reason to doubt him as being God in flesh? Well, of course not. If Jesus can do and did do all of those things, is there any reason to think he isn't the one and somebody else is going to come? Of course not. Jesus explains that now in his first coming, it was a time for him to show mercy. Judgment comes at his second coming. There is no doubt that Jesus is the Messiah that came from God. There is no doubt that John the Baptist was right the whole time. John the Baptist was a great prophet, but there is no doubt that Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. Jesus, being God, made a choice to lower himself to be born of a woman, a human. Jesus chose to become one with sinners like you and me. Jesus chose to become the least while hanging on the cross to make sinners like you and me the greatest by faith. So there is no doubt that Jesus is in fact the one we can look to for reassurance with all of our doubts because he is the one that has reconciled you back to the Father. Jesus lets us know that our knowledge of the truthfulness of Jesus as Lord is not found in our circumstances. Our faulty expectations of who we think Jesus should be or how he ought to act or the timing in which he should act are not the basis of our trust in him. We see that we have no reason to doubt when we look at the cross. Your certainty with God is not defined by material blessings or a lack thereof. Your certainty with God is not defined by a lack of stress or pain in your life or an overabundance of stress or pain in your life. Your certainty with God is not defined by your physical health or your lack thereof. Your certainty with God is found only in the life-giving death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, His body given, His blood shed for you. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Did John finally come to grips with his doubts? Well, we can assume so, because his faith was searching for a reason to believe, and Jesus gave him plenty of reasons to believe that Jesus is the one. And when our expectations about Jesus get contradicted by our experiences, leaving us in a spiritual crisis with our questions and our doubts, then we, like John, should bring our doubts and questions to Jesus. 
Are you the one who is to come, or is there someone else? And Jesus will answer you. And he will say, look at what you have seen. Blind people now see. Crippled people now walk. Lepers are cleansed of their disease. Deaf people now hear. Dead people are being raised back to life. The life-giving gospel of forgiveness is preached. And you have been baptized into me. You have been given eternal life in me. And I have been with you every step of every trial and every problem, every day of your life. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. You belong to Jesus. He is the Messiah, and he is overlooking you every single day, even when it might seem like he's not. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming very soon. And he's coming to give you life. Jesus is your Lord, and that is a fact that is true beyond any and all doubt. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until his second coming. Amen. We rise for the singing of our prayer hymn number 941. We praise you and acknowledge you, O God. <laughs>